This is ABTV, Animal Bites Television. Big constrictors and African rock pythons. You don't see them around much, and they're super cool. Woo! Look at she's starting to get real now. It's like, go ahead, mess with me a little more, why don't you? My name is Brian Bartrek. I'm no zoologist, just a guy with a passion for animals. And that passion often takes me on animal adventures around the world. This week, I'm outside of Toronto, Canada at an awesome reptile zoo named Reptilia. You're watching Snake Bites. So tell me a little bit about Reptilia. How long have you guys been around? Well, it's a pretty cool place. We started actually in 1997 as a place that did birthday parties and school programs, and then we expanded to having the whole zoo here in 2005 and haven't looked back. Take a look at this thing right here. Now this is absolutely adorable. Believe it or not, this is a little baby Solomon Island skink, or Carusha zebrata, and it's only a few days old. Now I've seen a ton of little prehensile tail skinks, but never one that's less than a week old. And I tell you, I can't believe how big they're born. And really, they only have one baby per every now and then maybe two, but typically only one baby. And now I kind of understand because an adult Karusha is only about this big. And look, at it's about half the size of its mom. That is just amazing. And of course, that's one of the reasons why these guys have been so you know, endangered with things is because their production isn't very good at all. And they're only in a very, very small amount of islands <laughs> where they're from. But I tell you, that is an adorable animal. And of course, these guys will hang on with their tails just like that. They just wrap around and they're completely an arboreal species. But take a look at that cute face. Man, I tell you what, <laughs> this thing is absolutely just melting my heart. So tell me who we have here. Well, this is Toothless. She's one of our American alligators. She's actually been with us for most of her life, but she's kind of got a unique story. She was uh, destined for the pet trade. She was smuggled into Canada. She was actually caught at the border. At the border. And how she was caught, she was actually sewn in the lining of the smuggler's jacket. Oh my and gosh. baby alligators being the vocal animals that they were, uh, they actually were calling for help from mom. And so the border the guards like, were What's kind that of noise? suspicious. <laughs> so she was just little when you guys got mm -hmm. her then, huh? How old is she? Be about 10 now. About 10. Well, she certainly likes to eat, I'm imagining, right? Oh, yeah. I tell you, I've always been fascinated by alligators. Come on, little girl. There you go, there you go. Thank you, girl. She is amazing, and uh, she's obviously very cooperative, but she has a boy in here, too, with her, right? Yeah. He's a little more shy with new people, I'm assuming. He is, yeah, he's <laughs> kind of a sissy. <laughs> <laughs> kind of a sissy. I tell you, I've always loved crocodilians. There it is. There they are, and there's always so cooperative when it comes to food. Oh, you stop it. Silly. Oh, thank you. <laughs> They're always so entertaining for sure. And uh, the thing that's nice about alligators really is, is I always call them the puppy dog of the, the crocodilian world because you can actually get this close to them. They, they're really cooperative. They really just want food. And, and you can really train them a lot just through like those types of food targeting as well. As long as they know they're gonna get fed, they pretty much will do almost anything that you want them to do. But uh, you wouldn't want to be like this with a saltwater croc, that's for sure. With a saltwater croc or a Cuban croc or something like that, if you were on this bench right now, you'd pretty much be food. <laughs> Look at her. Look at how awesome it is. What a great animal, huh? Tell me a little bit. I mean, this is, you know, because she's a girl, she's going to stay a little bit smaller. But I mean, this, is, this can live another 80 years, right? Yeah, potentially. Hopefully. <laughs> Hopefully here, right? So, um, what's the, so what's the plan here? I mean, do you have any other crocodilians? Uh, we do have some. We do have our big Nile crocodiles. Oh, so you have a big Nile, huh? Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. Yeah, and we have and you wouldn't want to be sitting payments. like this with a Nile crocodile, I don't think, right? A little bit different. Yeah. Uh, we do get pretty close to them when we feed them, but it's, it's with a lot of caution, a lot of respect. <laughs> yeah, they have so much more energy. Again, you know, it seems like alligators are, are uh, again, the puppy dogs, you know, they just want to kind of hang out and, and uh, they're, they're just so good. Whereas, you know, again, all crocodilians can be great, you know, no doubt about it. But the energy level of, uh, say, a Nile or a, a Perosis or, or uh, a Freshy or, or, or Cuban is, is completely different. I mean, they just like to jump and you know, go at you. So, uh, God, I tell you what, Toothless is amazing. Thank you so much for getting a chance to, to meet her and uh, give her some food. Oh, I tell you, I used to have a rock python when I was young, and, and she lived about 18 years. And I remember this sound very well. 
Just listen to that. <laughs> They're so vocal. As a matter of fact, at one point, I had a rock python that I, I was, when I lived in my mom's basement, and you could literally hear the animal hissing upstairs sometimes. So these guys are something else. And of course, they're one of the larger pythons on the planet, very heavy bodied animals. And again, they're pretty much from the, the more northern and southern part of the African continent. And uh, the, the way they catch these in the wild is pretty spectacular. Believe it or not, they'll typically live in big burrows and they actually send a native African down into one of those burrows, typically with just a piece of leather wrapped around his arm or his leg, and they put him down there, almost like a little anchor, and once that snake bites and kind of wraps him, they yank him and the snake out. <laughs> I tell you what, now that's one brave guy and an awesome job. I tell you what, I'll be honest with you, I wouldn't mind trying it sometime. And these rock pythons, whoo, listen to that thing go. <laughs> They're always amazing animals. I tell you, I'll always have a soft spot in my heart for big constrictors and African rock pythons. You don't see them around much, and they're super cool. Woo! Look, at she's starting to get real now. It's like, go ahead, mess with me a little more, why don't you? And she's totally opaque and in the blue, so if, I don't, if I'm not careful, she'll definitely take a pop shot at me. Whew. Now that is a cool animal. So what's the mission statement here? I mean, you're doing education. I mean, what, what exactly does Reptilia want to bring to people? That's definitely the big one, is we want to definitely promote education and conservation. Those two things are really our main goal. We do have tons and tons of visitors here, and so we do do daily shows and feedings, and so we're always trying to bring across those messages, busting myths that people have about these animals and getting people to get rid of their fears of them and hopefully see them in a positive light and getting those conservation messages across. But then we also do that when we go out to schools and other places as well. First off, I want to know how many people out there have been to a zoo and said, I wish I could climb into that enclosure. Well, I live a pretty lucky life and this is pretty cool just to hang out inside of enclosures. And of course, this is a really cool, interesting animal here. This is of course a legless lizard or a glass lizard. And it really looks an awful lot like a snake, right? But it's not, it's completely a lizard. And there's a few things that really determine the fact that it's a lizard compared to a snake. First off, you have the outer ears. You can see right here where there's actually outer ears on them. The other thing is that they actually have jaws that, that actually chew on on insects and so on like that, whereas obviously snakes will actually eat their prey completely live. And then lastly, the thing that really sets them apart is that they're almost all tail. With a snake this size, you know, a tail is probably going to be about this much of its body right here. With these legless lizards, that's where the anal vent is right here. So look at that. Really two-thirds of its body are actually part of its tail, which I find very interesting. And again, they're very legless. Or, ah, Again, they're very snake-like, which is pretty interesting, but they are definitely a lizard. And I've always find them really fascinating. Even there's this interesting crease in their body, the way they move, although they look a lot like a snake, they really move quite a bit different than a snake. They don't have that same undulating pattern that a snake has. It's just a really cool animal, and there's quite a few legless lizards in different places around the world. Uh, <laughs> They're just really, really, really cool animals. A little bit creepy though, don't you guys think? I mean, I kind of feel like if you're going to be a snake, just be a snake. But in a way, I guess this is what evolution is all about. Woohoo! These guys are little feisty monkeys, huh? So obviously what we have here, guys, is one of the coolest vipers in the world, in my opinion. And that's, of course, the sharp-nosed viper. So tell me a little bit about this guy. I mean, first off, I'm going to just kind of play with him and see if I can eventually get him out of this cage. But uh, here he comes. There, we go. there he comes. Look at that thing. Take a look at how gorgeous that is. Now, the thing that makes these things so incredible, of course, is as they get bigger, they've got that really cool colored head. Well, one of my favorite things about them is that even though they are a viper, and we usually know vipers to be lie-bearing species, this one actually lays eggs, and it's an extremely short incubation period, only about 21 days from the time they're laid to when they hatch. 21 days. So, so let me ask you, do you, do you think that the internal eggs stay longer so that the snake, when it actually is laid, is already developing in the egg? Is that probably what's happening? Yeah, most certainly. Okay, because that makes sense, because there's no way that it can go from a little zygote uh, embryo to this size in 21 days. 
right? No, no, they're pretty developed when they do uh, when they are first laid. Wow, that's amazing, and that's really cool because again, that's how evolution kind of works, right? Is it's it's one of those things that for whatever reason, if these eggs were sitting around for 60 days like most snakes, maybe they would have a much higher attrition rate. So Mother Nature says, hey, let's go ahead and cook half of them inside the female, and the other half when they finally lay. <laughs> oh my gosh, this thing is killing me with cuteness. But these certainly do pack quite a little bit of a punch. So. Uh, you don't want to get hit by something like this. And, and as most people know, it's, it's not that babies inject more venom, it's just that their venom yield for their size is typically larger than an adult the same size. So certainly a baby this size isn't going to inject more venom than, say, an adult. It's just that they, they seem to pump a little bit more venom in. And, uh, but with a lot of vipers and, and the lapids you know, as well, um, you know, oftentimes it's a dry bite too. They, these guys want to save their venom, you know what I mean? And uh, the general rule of thumb with any venomous snake is if you come across something like this, you're out vacationing or something like that, just leave it alone. It's not going to try to kill you. I've yet to ever have a snake actually chase me. Now certainly some people think that they will, but the truth is snakes are defensive, not aggressive. And uh, if you give them a nice wide berth, trust me, all they want to do is stay away from you. This is just a spectacular animal. Take a look at how gorgeous this animal is. This of course is a wood turtle. And these guys are omnivores, so they're gonna eat vegetation. They're also gonna eat a lot of worms and bugs and stuff like that. They're pretty critically endangered in a lot of areas. And of course they're called wood turtles because they kind of look like they're almost carved out of wood, right? But the thing that I love the most that I've heard about one of these guys is the fact that they'll actually stomp on the ground in order to get the worms to raise up out of the ground. Of course, we all know that worms come out when it rains and these turtles will actually stomp on the ground and kind of simulate the fact that rain is coming in hopes that worms will come up and then they have a pretty good lunch. But just look at the color on that animal. I mean, it's gotta be one of the cutest and most colorful turtles out there. I mean, look at that face. There's no way that anyone couldn't love a face like that. Holy cow. That is ridiculous right there. So, so tell me how you handle something like this because, I mean, not only tail like a, you know, three foot and then, of course, eight, nine footers. I mean, do you tail something like this or, I mean, is it just so close to your hand? Yeah, exactly. So usually I start with just the same baby hooks I'd use on a baby rattlesnake or the like as they're, they're growing and you can actually use these with caution to fairly decent size and then once they get a bit more bulk that you can bring in tongs or a hook and tail method. But uh, at the size they are now, you can manage them pretty easily. I guess I would be, I mean, can you give me a, de I mean, can we get, demonstrate what you, how you do that? Because the sure. thing that I'm, I always think of with the lapids like mambas and, and, and you know coastal taipans is they're so fast the hooks are just like this so but these chill out pretty good. Yeah the trick is getting him out initially so she's gonna want to continue to go through the, her little tree and her little uh, branch here but once you kind of get her then she tends to be a bit more calm and usually we have a goal in mind so we're not just holding her for a while she's got going into a holding van or right. something so you're not holding her for a really extended period where she's going to make the decision to keep going so when you kind of finally get them up they have that period of hesitation and then by the time they get into wherever they're going they're it's too late <laughs> too late to gotcha react. well uh without putting you in too much danger can we just take her out and put her back in yeah let's do it i want to see this <laughs> Now black mambas are, are some of the coolest, unbelievably sketchy snakes I've ever dealt with in my entire life. I was fortunate enough to be in South Africa earlier and uh, spend a couple days filming with these guys and, and uh, I tell you they move like no other snake I've ever seen and, and they act so intelligent. A lot of times they'll fly one way and as soon as you stop them they'll fly the other way immediately. Very nervous snakes but again they have a really bad reputation but the truth is is that um, they're very skittish and nervous animals. That's why there's not a whole lot of bites from black mambas from non-keepers. Typically the majority of bites actually come right like this from people that are actually keeping black mambas and uh, not to scare you, <laughs> so, like you know, jinx you into saying, oh, this is how it happens. But uh, obviously you're very, very um, experienced with this. And you can kind of see like the thing <laughs> about black mambas is, is, is like I was saying, they're so skittish and so fast, lightning quick that they're just flying around, so sticking them is really difficult. Like I said, with 
the, the, the animals I've dealt with have all been larger, so you're able to tail them and you can control that, that spine and kind of keep them in check. And if you're just doing two hooks, I mean, this is, this is pretty amazing. I'm, I'm excited to see how this is going to go because I've never seen a mom on a stick like this before. So, uh, what a But again, you know, they're so arboreal, you can see that it just wants to wrap itself around the trees. So yeah. as And sometimes the, what helps is just to kind of get some of the obstacles out of the way. Exactly. Now you get pretty masterful with uh, moving other random things other than snakes with hook sticks, so <laughs> now that uh, it's out of the way, then that helps a little bit. As long as you can get that initial scoop and get her to kind of settle, then... Now look at that. Oh my gosh. And, and see that now it just go. feels like it's on a tree branch, which is pretty amazing. I mean, I, I'm, I'm thoroughly impressed with the fact that you were able to kind of wrangle this guy Keep in like this. For a little bit anyway. <laughs> yeah, let's go ahead and get it back in so that we don't have to worry about it anymore. Oh, and I know that putting this back in probably with the hook is the smart idea. One of the things that venomous keepers that are, are don't get bit know about is that you never service a tank if a snake is in that tank with your hands, no matter what. Even if the snake is back there and you see the water dish right here, that's how you get bit right then. The only time you do that water is if that snake is in a holding cage, you know. And so, so putting this back certainly is not going to be by your hand. I'm sure no. of that. <laughs> and that's the way you stay completely safe with venomous snakes. So that was impressive, man. I'm, I'm, I, I guess I was taught something today. This was awesome. <laughs> Now this is an absolute treat because I've always thought that sailfin lizards or sailfin dragons were just amazing animals, but so many of them are so skittish that they're really hard to work with. As a matter of fact, a lot of times you'll see these guys will have bashed up faces, even in big exhibits because they're so skittish that when people come around they just run as fast as they can and they'll just smash yourself right into the wall. So it's kind of a hard animal to keep. And I'll be honest with you, I never thought I was going to be able to just kind of have one chilling on my shoulder like this. Just completely cool. I've always just thought that these guys were kind of the, the coolest, most prehistoric looking animal. Kind of like that Godzilla thing with that huge thing going on here, of course, why they call them sail fins. And some of the species of these guys that come from anywhere from the Philippines all over Southeast Asia can be amazingly bright in color. And I tell you what, although I've always thought they were difficult to work with. If I could ever have one like this, I'd, I'd trade my husky in a second to have this as a lizard. Oh my gosh, is this thing cool or what? I mean, wow. I tell you, this, Reptilia is blowing me away so far. I've been here for an hour or two or something like that, and this has probably been one of the coolest reptile experiences of my life. I tell you, anyone that's out there that gets up into the Toronto area, if you don't come to see Reptilia, I don't know what's wrong with you because this place is absolutely my Disneyland. And as always, I was Facebooking and tweeting my way through it, so make sure to follow me over at Snakebites TV and on Instagram at snakebites.tv. Until next week, you've been watching Snake Bites. Hi, I'm Peter Birch, an Aussie bloke who loves wildlife. My respect for nature started when I was a young boy in rural New South Wales. Since then, it's exploded into an obsession. New episodes every Thursday, only on Animal Bites TV.